Hello, and welcome to everyone joining us for this X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled 30 Years with the Knee Injury and Osteoarthritis Outcome Score. My name is Corey Stanton, and I'll be your X Talks host for this event. Today's presentation runs for approximately 60 minutes, and the webinar includes an interactive Q&A session with our speakers. At this point, I'd like to thank MAPI Research Trust, who developed the content for this presentation. MAPI Research Trust is a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping the entire scientific community build patient-centric endpoint strategies and to facilitate access to clinical outcome assessments, commonly abbreviated as COAs. With more than 30 years of experience in the field of COAs and with the online platform eProvide, which includes access to all of its COA services, along with databases on COAs, COA label claims with pro labels, and guidance with pro insight, MAPI Research Trust is the preeminent source of information on COAs. Exclusive distributor of over 800 COAs, MAPI Research Trust is the most trusted name in the distribution of COA instruments. One of our speakers today is Professor Eva Roos. Professor Roos is a dedicated researcher in the field of muscle and joint health with a focus on patient reported outcomes, exercise therapy, surgical treatments, and clinical care pathways. She has authored over 300 peer-reviewed publications, including groundbreaking trials comparing exercise therapy to orthopedic surgery. Professor Roos has translated her research into widely utilized patient-reported outcome measures and clinical tools, benefiting over 100,000 patients across 10 countries. And joining Professor Roos is Katie Flynn. Katie has over 10 years of experience in account management and international business development in multi-channel sales, where she gained extensive client services experience. In 2023, Katie joined the Author Collaboration Unit at MAPI Research Trust to establish new collaborations with the authors and or copyright holders of COAs and assist them with the daily management of their questionnaires. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over to our first speaker, Professor Eva Roos. Professor Roos, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. So here we go. It's great to be here and great to see that there is someone out there listening. Thank you for joining us today. So I'm going to talk about the 30 years that I've had with COOS. And my background is that I graduated as a physical therapist 1981. And I've been working in sports medicine and orthopedics most of the time. And I've treated many, many patients with knee injury and osteoarthritis. But I'm also a very curious person, and I eventually pursued uh, a PhD. Uh, and the COOS was part of my PhD. And ever since, which is the last 25 years, uh, I have been working full time as a researcher, and I've had the opportunity to use this instrument both uh, as a primary outcome in randomized controlled trials and in cohort studies and other studies. And you will see during this presentation that my background heavily influences today's agenda, which will be mostly about uh, interpretation and, and use of the coups. I would like to uh, share that I do have conflicts of interest because I am the devel developer and copyright holder of coups, and royalties are collected from commercial users since May 2023 while students and academics can use the cues free of charge, but still have to register. So today's presentation builds on this uh, recent uh, narrative review that was published, Open Access in Osteoarthritis in Cartage. And I hope that you have already received it. And if not, you can download it um, uh, from PubMed. And there you will find more details on the aspects that I will be speaking to today. So there will be a short introduction why the COOS was developed. It will be about the five subscale structure. Uh, and it's a little bit about how we can use COOS as a primary outcome in clinical trials and interpretation and categorization of coup scores. And this is interesting, I think, both for clinicians who use it in their daily practice and for researchers in communicating their results. I will also, and, and interpretation of thresholds is part of uh, interpretation. 
and then I will end up with some varieties of cues intended for, for um, uh, children and a short form that can be used, for example, in registries. I also would like to mention what today's talk is not about. It's not about measurement properties. Uh, so for those of you who are very interested in psychometrics, I would like to refer you to this systematic review and meta-analysis that we conducted a few years ago that includes where well, we have summarized the results of 37 available uh, psychometric studies on the coups. And um, because there are so many studies, we know that coups is not a perfect instrument, but we really know a lot about its pros and cons. And that, of course, influences how I recommend uh, to use it. So 30 years ago, when I embarked on this project, the evaluation of knee injury and osteoarthritis was largely driven by disease measures. So on this figure here, you can see examples for osteoarthritis, and that would be imaging findings, uh, like x-rays, today it would be MRIs, it could be biomarkers, it could be arthroscopic findings. That is what we usually used in, in studies and reported in trials. There was very little attention uh, to illness. And if we look at knee injury, it would be that we had a focus on knee laxity, uh, but very less, or I would say less focus on uh, function. Today, we know that for several reasons, it's, it's, these are two related, but distinctly different aspects of disease. And uh, it's really good, I think, to look at different perspectives. So I'm not saying that we should only look at illness. It's depending on the study uh, question. It is also, of course, very interesting to look at disease measures, but the more uh, perspectives we take, uh, the more we will learn about the outcome. Uh, but today, uh, there has been a paradigm shift, and today there is consensus that illness is the primary perspective in clinical research. And patients are the experts of their own symptoms today. Before, uh, when I started, you could hear things like, we cannot trust patients. How should they know about their need, et cetera? Uh, and that has completely changed today. Uh, I also got uh, feedback when I sent in papers that uh, we could not use patient reported outcomes to ask patients about their needs because that was way too complicated. That has also completely changed today. And today, uh, Food and Drug Administration, for example, requires patient reported outcome measures as the primary outcome in clinical trials. And COOS is one such commonly used patient reported outcome uh, in knee injury and osteoarthritis research. And as I said, we know a lot about the measurement properties and that also guide how we recommend to use the instrument. So when COOS was developed in 1998, it filled a gap because at that time, there was no patient reported outcome that existed for younger or more physically active individuals with knee osteoarthritis. And if you look at the table here, you can see COOS was developed in 1998. That's when the first paper was published. And you can see there were two more instruments, the ACL quality of life instrument and the AD LS instrument that were published the same year. Uh, but if we look at these uh, three instruments, you can also see that the only instrument that was developed to be intended to use from the time of the injury to severe osteoarthritis is the CUS. And the benefit of that is, of course, that you can use the instrument at, uh, throughout the lifespan and also that you can use it when you have post-traumatic osteoarthritis, for example, after a knee injury. You can also see that CUES measures on all the three levels uh, according to uh, WHO's 
measurements level. And, and back in the 90s, they were called impairment, disability, and handicap. They have other names today that are considered more positive. Um, and the thing is that cues measures at these different levels in different subscales. So they're not mixed, these different levels. They're kept apart uh, by the use of different subscales. So cues has five subscales. Pain, other symptoms, which would be like uh, stiffness, swelling, um, restricted range of motion, and mechanical noise, etc. It would be AGL function. It would be sport and recreation function, and it would be knee-related quality of life. So five separate subscales. And when you report um, these subscales, you should do that uh, graphically. You should do that, <coughs> sorry, uh, in this order. So the order should always be pain, symptoms, ADL, sport, rec, quality of life. And you should do it on a scale from zero to 100. And please always include uh, the whole axis from zero to 100. Uh, that's the best way of displaying cues. And this is in line with other patient reported outcomes, more generic measures like the SF36, where you also generate this profile. And that makes it very easy to, for example, compare over time. Uh, uh, where you can see also that these um, subscales may change to a different extent. So there are many reasons why we decided uh, to keep subscales and not have an aggregated instrument where everything is, where you would take apples and bananas and everything and made a, make a fruit salad out of it and come up with an aggregated score. So it is because they are distinct but related domains that can be covered by one instrument. Because uh, from a practical point of view, it's good to have one instrument that can cover uh, very different domains because we know that all these domains are relevant to patients. And at the time when we started, quality of life was not very commonly uh, de uh, determined in these patients. So it was an easy way of adding it to the more commonly uh, evaluated function in knee injury patients and pain in osteoarthritis patients. For us, it was also a, a good way of dealing with um, different functional levels because we do know that the uh, level of function that is expected by a young person suffering from a knee injury is quite different from an older person with advanced osteoarthritis. So this is a way uh, of accommodating all these, uh, th this variation. So we have two physical activity uh, subscales that where one deal more with um, AGL function and one deal more with sport and recreation function. Uh, and also, it's the same thing. Pain was commonly measured in osteoarthritis, and in the symptom subscales, we uh, collected symptoms that clinicians and patients with knee injury would think uh, were very relevant. And that was, again, swelling, uh, lack of range of motion, mechanical noises, etc. With time and with more studies, we have learned that there is a huge overlap uh, for these uh, patient categories. So what we see uh, and what we know today is that also patients with an ACL injury or meniscal injury or something else, they have pain. Uh, and also patients with osteoarthritis have these other symptoms. So there's actually uh, quite a substantial overlap and it can be difficult to differentiate uh, patients depending on their symptoms. Uh, to see what structural damage they have. I would say that is very difficult, if not impossible. And one thing that I think is often misunderstood that is good to know, that is that these subscales are validated for individual use. So it, it's really up to you as a clinician or the researcher to decide 
what subscales you would like to use, what subscales you think are relevant for the group of patients that you would like to uh, evaluate and, and maybe follow over time. I think that is important to know. So to take an example, the sport and rec subscale, which hold items such as squatting, running, jumping, turning, twisting, and kneeling, are often considered not so relevant for people, for older people with uh, severe osteoarthritis having their joints replaced. But the interesting thing is that if we ask these patients, three out of four, they do expect improvements in these items. So it may not be relevant directly post-operatively, but it may be interesting in the long run. And if you don't assess it the baseline, you cannot see if there actually is an improvement. We also have the ADL subscale that holds 17 items. And that is, of course, less relevant in younger adults. But again, if you don't establish it at baseline, uh, you cannot see a change uh, in long-term follow-ups. And as you will see later on, uh, there is a difference. Uh, young people, they do not tolerate much uh, impact on their ADL uh, to be happy with the outcome of an intervention. So in, in most cases, the CUS 5 subscale structure is advantageous because it, may, it makes it possible for us to have one instrument that is valid across the lifespan and that covers different structural uh, problems. And it is helpful for clinicians because it is straightforward to see what domains or what subscales that are affected. And this can actually help you to know what, how, what you should target your treatment towards. And I think that is a good thing because as a clinician, you can know that uh, if you have your patients uh, answer the cues prior to a treatment, you can be pretty sure that you have covered uh, the most common um, problems that patients have if they have a knee injury or osteoarthritis for that sake. Uh, it's also good, I think, uh, with a five-scale substrum because it, it allows you to pick different subscales for different types of studies. So let's say that you're a drug company and you would like to do a drug trial. For you, it may be a good thing to use Coos pain as your primary outcome because pain is what you think uh, you will change with your new drug. And for physios who would like to do an exercise trial, it may be better to use the Coos AGL or the Coos Port Rec, depending on the physical activity level of the group they're studying, as a primary outcome. But whatever your choice is, the remaining subscales should be reported as secondary outcomes to enhance uh, clinical interpretation. That is important. So it requires some thinking with an instrument that has five subscales because um, which is my primary outcome? And it is also there is also this problem with multiplicity, uh, which is a statistical problem that can affect, affect your sample size when you do a study that you have to consider. And there are at least two ways, and I would like to put forward two ways that I have considered how you can deal uh, with this. Uh, and of course, I've been discussing this at length with different statisticians throughout my research career. So there are at least two approaches that can be used. And one is to apply an aggregate subscale score, CUS4, and I'll talk more about what that is. And the other one is to use hierarchical testing of the individual CUS subscales. 
The most commonly used for Qs is the first one with an aggregate subscale score, and the lesser used is hierarchical testing. But they would both uh, work well from a statistical point of view without increasing your sample size. So if we have a look at Qs4, that is an aggregate score. And it is calculated as the mean of the included subscale scores. And that is important because that gives equal weight to the subscale. And Qs4 stands for that usually it is four of the five subscales that are included in uh, this score. And I think it is very important to emphasize that this is intended for statistical purposes only, and I'll come back to this. And again, report the Q subscales as secondary uh, outcomes because that will allow for clinical interpretation because it, it's not a given that these subscales change at the same rate. So here is a table from the uh, review that I just recommended you to download if you don't have it already, if you're interested in this. Uh, and if we look at the left side of the panel here, well, you actually only see the left side, that is about how an aggregate score has been applied in, in, in real life. So here are examples from three uh, randomized controlled trials uh, where, uh, let's see, it has been, in the first one, it was ACL reconstruction versus a, a plus rehab versus rehab only, the Canoon trial. The second one is the omics trial where we compared uh, orthoscopic partial meniscectomy against surgery versus uh, rehab only in middle-aged people. And the third example was from um, older people who were eligible to have their joint replaced, where we compared having total knee replacement uh, combined with a three-month non-surgical treatment package compared to only having the non-surgical treatment package. And uh, the references, you'll find them in the paper and they have been published two of them in new england journal of medicine and the third one in british medical journal so the way that coos 4 was used in these these three trials differed depending on the population so in the young group having an acl injury coos 4 was composed by pain symptoms sport rec and quality of life and that was based on a discussion among the authors. And in this case, we compared a surgical and a non-surgical intervention. So we uh, were considering how these two different type of interventions that are quite different, would what, what, what was the possible impact they could have on these uh, subscales. And we came up with these four subscales. And as you can see, it was sport and rec that was included for young patients and not ADL because that, from a statistical point of view, would only create noise for this younger group as the primary outcome. But we had all the five subscales as the secondary outcomes. So in older patients who had um, severe knee osteoarthritis, Coos 4 consists of pain symptoms, AGL, and quoted life. So Coos 4 is not necessarily the same because it can hold four subscales. And for the middle-aged, it was decided among the authors that this was a Norwegian group and they were quite active. So it was Ford and Rec that was included. But just to make things complicated, uh, there are also other examples. Uh, and there is one example where all five subscales were included for middle-aged people, and then it was Qs5 that was the primary outcome. So there is, this requires some thinking uh, and a good understanding of the patients that you're studying from the authors.
And I really, really would like to encourage that I think that a CUSPOR should not be used under any other circumstances than as the primary outcome in RCTs. Because it is intended for statistical purposes only. And it cannot be clinically interpreted because it cannot be teased out, as I said before, if the included subscales have changed at the same rate. And we cannot even know if they've changed in the same direction. They often do, but we cannot be sure. And Q score assumes equal importance of the included subscales, and that is not necessarily so. So let's look at the other option, hierarchical testing, which I think is a quite a, a smart way of doing it uh, without having to increase your, increase your sample size, where actually you potentially can test all five uh, subscales. So what you do is that you list the subscales in a well-considered hierarchy. So you start with a subscale that you think is most relevant for the group and the intervention that you're studying. And then you continue with the second, the third, uh, etc. So you list them in order of, of um, relevance. And then you start when you have the results and you look at the between group results in change. You would uh, start with the most relevant subscale. And let's see, say that you will end up with a p-value of 0 0.03. Uh, and that is um, significant if you have set the the, um, the limit to p 0 0.05. Then you can go on with the second. In this case, it is quality of life, and you test that one as well, and you find a p value of 0 0.05. So then you have you know that there is a significant difference between the two uh, treatments for these two subscales. And then you test the third one, which is pain, and you get a non-significant result. Then you have to stop here, and you do not test symptoms in ADL. And you can then conclude on the significant subscale results. So in this case, you can conclude that the patients improved in sport and rec uh, function and in quality of life. So you can actually have two outcomes here that you report without uh, affecting your sample size or your power. So if you look at the right-hand side of the panel here, uh, there are some examples of hierarchical testing. And, and the order here is based on uh, what we have learned from psychometric uh, studies. And uh, those that are numbered here for young adults with knee injury, sport and rec function and quality of life. That is the order uh, that has been established based on uh, psychometric properties, including relevance and how these subscales perform. Uh, the other three subscales, the order of pain, symptoms, and ADL is actually my recommendation. So the two first are based on evidence. The last three are based on recommendation. If we look at Older patients with uh, osteoarthritis, there is evidence support uh, ordering three subscales, pain, AGL, and quality of life. And the two last ones, sport and rec and symptoms, are based on my recommendation. So there are two ways you can deal with uh, this five-subscale five structure if you would like to use CUS as a primary outcome in a randomized controlled trial. So now I would like to change topic and speak a little bit about interpretation. Because um, when you tell a patient that, ah, you have a CUS score, sub, uh, let's say a sport and rec score of 78, patient look like a big question mark, you know, what, what, is that, what does that represent? Or uh, when you read a conclusion uh, in a study, it could be similarly difficult to interpret what does this really represent? So I will touch uh, upon a few different aspects here that I think are interesting. 
And we'll start with how we score the, the individual items and the coups, the scoring direction, and how you can use the words that patients are using to respond to the items, to actually categorize these scores. And then I will end up uh, in speaking a little bit about interpretation thresholds, like minimal important change, patient acceptable symptom state, and treatment failure. So this is for my thesis, uh, like from last century, 1999, on how to calculate the CUS subscale score. And uh, today we use Excel sheets, and you can get that uh, from Mappy. Uh, and I would say that most people today also collect uh, their data electronically in research, at least. Uh, often also in the clinic, but sometimes on paper in the clinic. But either way, patients respond to each individual item using a five-point Likert scale. And for most of the studies, these five uh, options respond to no, mild, moderate, severe, and extreme pain or difficulty with a specific function uh, there are some other options for some of the other subscales, but, but the idea is the same. It goes from no uh, to extreme uh, problems, difficulty, uh, pain, etc. We then transform uh, these scores to a one zero to 100 scale. And you need to uh, respond or your patients have to respond to 50% of the items to calculate a valid subscale uh, score. And again, this has been determined together with statisticians, um, uh, this cutoff. So to simplify, some like to calculate a total Q score instead of the five subscales. And I would like to uh, strongly advise you not to do that because that threatens the validity for both younger and older uh, groups of patients because a total score is not interpretable for many reasons. It gives unequal weight to subscale uh, domains because the CUS subscale, they hold between four and 17 items, these different subscales. And if you look at the younger group, you've just heard that the sport and rec and the quality of life subscales, they are the most important subscales for younger subjects. And they only corresponds to nine out of 42 items, which is 21% of the total score. And for the older group, pain and ADL, they are equally important, but they hold very different number of items. And that gives an unequal weight in a total score. So if you see publications where a total uh, summary Q score has been used, I would say you cannot, uh, you cannot trust um, the results. So the direction of coups is from zero to 100, from worst to best. And that is the way it's usually in orthopedics. Higher numbers, more points, better result. If uh, I have been working in the field of rheumatology, I have, but uh, I started my career in orthopedics. In rheumatology, it's usually the reversed where zero would be, be zero disability and 100 would be, would be extreme disability. And this can very often be confusing. And you will find in the literature sometimes that Qs has been reversed uh, because um, it's used to compare to another instrument that has another direction. So this is something to look out for um, and make sure that you interpret the results um, correctly. But this is the scoring direction that Coos was born with and that I recommend. 100 is the best result. So if we have this zero 
200 scale. And we then know that patients to start with actually responded to each item on a Likert scale ranging from no to extreme. And we have this subscale score where now we have transformed it and converted it. So 100 uh, represents, well, let's see, that would represent no uh, problems, 75 would represent mild problems, 50 moderate, 25 severe, and zero extreme. And this is just the average that you will get if patients have responded the same to all the items on the subscale. That it not, is not necessarily so, but if we make that assumption, this is what you will end up with. And if we then just make cutoffs to do uh, to um, look at what the uh, thresholds would be, we can come up with thresholds for five categories that patients have reported on average, no symptoms on average, mild symptoms on average, moderate, etc. And I think this uh, can be used in communication, both with patients in the clinic. We can say you have an average mild problems and also in uh, conclusions or when you would like to communicate your results in uh, studies you can say that following this and that intervention patients change from having severe to having mild symptoms for example. I think this is uh, a meaningful way of interpreting uh, a subscale score. So giving Adding words to the numbers can be really helpful in communication, both with individual patients and in communicating your research results. Uh, there are some thresholds that we use in research uh, to uh, look at the clinical relevance of our results. So, there are studies that have been uh, conducted on CUS and many other, other instruments, many, many studies, to look at minimal important change. And this is the most commonly used threshold that we report in clinical trials to look at number need, of, number need to treat, for example. I would like to push a bit for some other thresholds, patient acceptable symptom state and treatment failure. And between these two groups, you would be undecided. So I'll speak a little bit about these and how they differ. So if we look at the minimum important change, that corresponds to feeling better. That is a change uh, from before a treatment to after a treatment with time. So that's a longitudinal score change. And when you uh, are going to calculate the minimum important change, that's a psychometric methodological study. Uh, there is consensus that anchor-based methods are preferred. There are also distribution-based methods, but anchor-based me methods are preferred. And then you use uh, a, a global uh, scale where patients, uh, you, you know their score change, and they also respond to a glo this global uh, score change here, where they can say if they are much better, a little better, no difference, a little worse, or much worse. And, and that is the, the basis in, in how you calculate this. And then you can do it using different statistical methods. Back in the days, it was the mean change method, which is a simple method. Then it was a receiver operating characteristic method. And today is um, more commonly predict predictive modeling that is used. And the reasons for that is that it's more precise because we can adjust for um, aspects that we know are important. For example, it can uh, can adjust for the correlation between the anchor and the PROM uh, change, because we know um, that impacts uh, on our findings. It can also be used to adjust for the proportion of people who report to have improved. That would be the green on the figure you can see here, uh, and not improved, that is the other. If that difference, or that proportion is different for 50%, so when you use the receiver operating characteristic method, 
that it's implicit that it is 50% that should improve and 50% should not. That is very rarely the case in sports medicine and orthopedics, where usually a much higher proportion uh, improve. And we can adjust for that uh, with predictive modeling. So that is the preferred method today, but I'm sure there will be newer methods. And there are methods uh, under development that also use eigenresponse theory. Uh, so minimal important change corresponds to feeling better. And because of all the reasons that I just gave you, you will find that MIC can vary widely within the same group of patients, uh, depending on the anchor of question that has been used, the cutoff level of the anchor of question. So was it a five scale or a five um, a five item or a seven item scale and was it a little better that was required or was it somewhat better what was it and it's also the correlation of the anchor question and the uh, prom change and the statistical method so basically you can always find a threshold to your liking and this i think is very worrisome and I sometimes, when I cannot sleep at night, I wonder if we have um, spent a lot of resources uh, or taken the wrong conclusions because we have just picked uh, a threshold that maybe not was the best threshold to pick. Uh, I write a little bit more about this in this uh, systematic uh, or in, in this narrative review. So, uh, as alternatives to minimal important change, I would like to push a bit for patient acceptable symptom state, treatment failure, and those that don't know if they're feeling good, feeling bad, they're just in between and undecided. And this is post-treatment score. So that is different. That is not change score, which we commonly look at in studies. This is post-treatment scores. And uh, to come up and to calculate a threshold for pass and treatment failure, we do it in the same way. We have an anchor question uh, where patients respond yes, no, um, if they are satisfied with the treatment result. And uh, if, if not, they can then get a second question if they think that the outcome is so poor that they find that the treatment has failed. So you will end up with three groups, satisfied, failed, and those that are undecided. And the reason why I think it is interesting to combine these different thresholds is because you do not necessarily get the same result. So you can interpret study results quite differently depending on what you ask for. So here's an example from our Canoon study where we uh, compared ACL reconstruction followed by rehab um, versus rehab only. And we found no difference between these two treatment strategies. So here uh, is the whole cohort uh, together. So what we find here when we ask these, uh, when we apply these thresholds for minimum important change for patient acceptable symptom state and treatment failure is that when we ask or have a look at the data, we find that nine out of 10 feel better after the treatment, regardless of what treatment they got. And, and that's, that's pretty good, isn't it? Nine out of 10 feel better. As a clinician, that makes me a bit worried because it does not really fit with uh, what I see in the clinic. Uh, but if we ask them if they're satisfied with the result, it's actually only five out of 10 that feel good about their knee. So that's a huge difference. There are, here's a huge discrepancy depending on the question that we ask. Do you feel better or do you feel good? And we also find that one out of 10 actually think that the treatment has failed. And that had made me wonder if the reason why we like memory important change, because as clinicians and as researchers, we would like to make a difference. 
So we would like to look at the difference from before a treatment to after a treatment, because if there is an improvement, uh, we have been successful, either as a clinician or as a researcher. But it may be, uh, and there is some evidence pointing in that direction, that patients actually are much more concerned about how they are right now uh, compared to if they have improved or not. They are much more interested in, am I happy with my knee as it is right now? And one thing that supports that, that if you look at the correlation between these questions and the post-treatment score and the change score, you find that the correlation with the patient's uh, rate of satisfaction after treatment always correlates much better with the post-treatment score than with the change score. So I think it is fair to patients to also ask them about uh, or, or to use past and treatment failure when we report data from studies. So here we have this uh, categorization of the Q score again from no to extreme categories. And I've plotted uh, pass and treatment failure thresholds from uh, young, pe young people having an ACL tear who have been treated with ACL reconstruction or rehab only. There's no difference between the groups. And what you can see here is that the pass thresholds they vary from no to mild problems with the different subscales. So what you can see is that young patients, they, uh, they require a score of 95 when it comes to ADL. They, they cannot tolerate uh, any uh, restrictions in their ADL uh, to say that they are happy with their knee. And that seems fair if you are a young person. And then you can see they can tolerate a little bit more pain, a little bit more symptoms, and they can actually tolerate to have mild impairment with their quality of life and to have mild problems with their sport and recreation function and still be happy about their knee. If we then look at the treatment failure thresholds, you can see that for ADL, they only accept to have mild problems with a knee before they think the treatment has failed. So that, of course, corresponds to uh, the high score of 95 or high threshold of 95 to, to um, think that the treatment is a success. And you can see it's about the same order of the subscales here, but you can also see that they actually they accept to have severe problems with sport and rec and quality of life. They accept that before they say that the treatment has failed. So they have scores below 28 before they say the treatment has failed when it comes to sport and rec and quality of life. And I think this uh, also points to the importance of reporting these different subscales separately. Never, ever summarize them. So to uh, end this webinar, from my point of view, uh, I would like to just say a few words about two other versions that we have worked with over the years. So the first one is Ku's Child. And the reason why we did it, because unfortunately, many children also have uh, knee injuries. And we realized that uh, they can have difficulty understanding and, and misinterpreting uh, terms. And we have done uh, qualitative studies and interviews with boys and girls age seven and older, and that was a lot of fun. And we made some changes to accommodate uh, these kids. And for example, there are drawings to exemplify what we mean with uh, squatting, for example. So we recommend to use the Coos child in school-aged children with a major knee injury. But once they get older, they can continue with the Coos child or they can switch to the adult Coos. 
Qs12 uh, is a quite new kid on the block. And the initiative to uh, develop Qs12 came from Barbara Gandic, who is uh, or do a statistician from the US. Barbara has unfortunately passed away. Uh, and she has worked with John Ware, who is the developer of SF36 for decades. And it was such a pleasure to collaborate uh, with these very, very clever people on coming up with a short version of the QS. And it is primarily intended for older adults evaluated in surgical registries. And the most common ones would be to have total knee replacement. And in a registry, you collect a lot of data and you would like to have as few items as possible. And we have had uh, many, many discussions on what we would like to measure uh, with as few items as possible. So we ended up, to make a long story short, we ended up with a, um, an instrument that has 12 items uh, and three subscales, pain, function, and quality of life. And these three domains are the ones that are recommended by uh, orsi Omarac to evaluate in uh, people with osteoarthritis. But we also have a summary joint impact score that has that is a validated score for this subscale. So all these subscales have four items each, and the, you can actually for QS12 calculate the summary joint impact score. Uh, so QS12 has been found to be a reliable and valid alternative to the full-length QS in patients having total knee replacement. And of course, uh, responding to 12 questions uh, is better compared to responding to 42 questions uh, in terms of time and, and responding burden. And these results are being confirmed by an Australian groups. Uh, but they, what they found was that there may be missing content for high functioning patients. And I already told you that, that many patients with uh, having uh, their joints replaced, they actually have expectations of having higher function than maybe most surgeons believe. So um, that's not so uh, strange because in the QS12, Three out of four um, items are picked from the ADL subscale, and only one is from the sport and rec subscale. And the solution to this, if you would like, would like to make sure that you have validity also for uh, patients with higher function, and that could be those with osteoarthritis, or it could also be younger people in an ACL uh, registry, for example, you could add the other uh, four items from the Q sport break subscale, so you could actually calculate the Q sport break uh, score. So uh, then you only have 16 items, uh, and you can also accommodate people with um, higher functioning expectations, and both for the younger groups and for the older groups. So with this, I would like to say thank you very much for listening. It's been my pleasure, and I hope you have many questions that we can discuss uh, afterwards. And now I would like to uh, hand over to Katie. Thank you so much, Professor Roos, and thank you for that very informative presentation. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. So I would like to thank you all for joining today. Um, as mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, my name is Katie Flynn and I am an account manager within the author collaboration unit at MAPI Research Trust. And within my role, I am the dedicated contact for the COOS. In the following slides, I will take you through the COOS and other measures which MAPI Research Trust manages on behalf of Professor Roos. We will review how to access the COOS, the conditions of use, existing language versions, and also their derivative works. Apologies. So firstly, what is MAPI Research Trust's role as the distributor of the COOS? We centralize all of the information related to the original version of the questionnaire and translations. Uh, 
We also manage end user requests. We actually have a team of experts called our COA licensing team who manage approximately 1200 um, end user requests on an annual basis. We also manage the full end to end licensing process that we're going to see in some further depth in a future slide. And of course, we manage the distribution. And finally, we coordinate requests for new translations and electronic migration. At the end of this slide, you can see a direct link to the COOS webpage, which is located on our eProvide platform. eProvide is a platform that is managed and owned by MAPI Research Trust, and it's where we've essentially consolidated all of the information relating to instruments which we distribute, um, our different databases and our services. So how do you access the COOS? In this slide, we'll review accessing the COOS as an academic user. And in the following slide, we will review how to access the COOS if you are a healthcare organization or a commercial user. So academic users can be defined as students, individual healthcare practitioners, which is including but not limited to physicians, clinicians, or any other healthcare providers from an individual practice. If you intend to use the COOS and you fall under this scope of user, you will see no licensing fees. You can also access the COOS via our online distribution service um, through a direct download. And you will have to sign a free online license agreement. This is really to ensure that you are fully aware of the conditions of use for the COOS and of course that the scientific integrity is maintained. So if you fall under this scope of user and you want to access the COOS, you will first have to visit the COOS webpage. The link is included in this slide. Then on the left hand menu, select access this questionnaire and finally download questionnaire. Now let's take a look at accessing the COOS as either a healthcare organization or a commercial user. So firstly, if you fall under the scope of a commercial health, excuse me, fall under the scope of a commercial user or a private healthcare organization, you will be required to pay a per study or an annual license fee. This is really dependent on your intended scope of use of the COOS. You will also be required to pay a per language fee and a per administration fee. Alternatively, if you fall under the scope of a public healthcare organisation which is funded by governmental funds or the European Commission, you will be required to pay a per study or an annual licence fee, again depending on the scope of use, and a per language fee. So how do you go about um, accessing the, the COOS under these scope of users? Firstly, you will have to access our eProvide platform and the link is in the slide in step one here. If you haven't already done so, you will then have to create your client account and you do this through clicking on my eProvide and then going to my client account. And finally, once your client account has been successfully created, you will click on the submit a request um, icon, which you can see in the screenshot at the end of the slide. This is where you complete all of the information on your intended use. You can also upload documentation here if applicable. Once you submit that request, then you will receive a receipt of request. And this is the point that our COA licensing team, which I referred to earlier, comes into play and they help to manage the request with you. So in this slide, I will take you through the full end-to-end -end licensing process. Step one, we've just seen, submit the request. Then step two, you will be required to sign what's called a MULA or a master user license agreement. Step three is the signature of a work order for the COOS, which will detail all of the study details. And then depending on a couple of different factors, you may be required to pay licensing fees. So this could be dependent on your scope of use. Is it a study specific use or an annual fee? Or also, as we've seen in the previous slide, what category of user do you fall under? Are you an academic, a healthcare organization or a commercial user? Finally, 
permission for use is granted and it's at this point that the original version of the questionnaire will be provided to you along with scoring instructions and also if you had requested any existing language versions these will be provided to you at this point. So in the previous slide I touched on existing language versions and I wanted to go a bit more in depth into it in this slide. So the COOS was originally developed in English for USA and Swedish for Sweden. As of today, we have approximately 60 existing language versions available for the COOS. And if you want to access all of the available translations, you can do this through accessing the COOS webpage on our eProvide platform. If you still have any questions about the existing language versions, please feel free to submit a request and our COA licensing team is more than happy to help. At MAPI Research Trust, we also manage the development of the COOS's derivative works. So this is namely requests for new translations and electronic migration. And if you are interested in developing a derivative work of the questionnaire, please again, access the eProvide platform and submit a request and our co-licensing team will coordinate this request with you. That concludes my presentation. I would really urge you to visit uh, the COOS webpage on our eProvide platform as it's really a wealth of knowledge in relation to the instrument and should you have any questions following this again feel free to submit a request and our team will help you. So I'll hand back to you Corey for the Q&A next. Excellent. Thank you very much, Katie and Professor Roos, for that insightful presentation. Uh, we do have time for just a couple questions here uh, during the Q&A. Uh, and the first one here that we've got from an audience member here actually is for you, Professor Roos. Uh, this uh, person is asking, they're saying they're a clinician and they work with uh, knee injured patients. Uh, could you please expand upon how you think COOS could be used uh, in the clinic? Thank you for the question. I think it's a good question and uh, I think you can use it in several different ways. I would say that the first time you see the patients, you can hand out the cues in, in the waiting area and you can have them fill it in before you see them. Uh, if you do it on paper, very old school on paper, that will give you a very quick overview of uh, this particular patient's concerns and what their uh, problems may be and where you should target your uh, treatment. So I think that's a, it's a very good uh, support in, in when you decide what to do with the patient because you know that you have covered most that is important for these patients. And the second aspect that I think is important uh, when you treat patients is that you measure their progress or not because that can also tell you something about if you are on the right way with the treatment or if you maybe should change treatment or do something differently great thank you very much professor for that answer uh this next question here uh and it's our last one we'll use to to wrap it up um for katie actually this audience member wants to know what the process is to develop um, an electronic version of the coos yeah. Absolutely, great question. Um, so firstly, as we always suggest, go to our eProvide platform and you firstly will need to sign a license as we've just seen in my presentation. Once that license has been signed, MAPI Research Trust will then provide the user with the guidelines for electronic migration. And really then after that, depending on the category of user, so are you that academic user, are you a commercial company, uh, the pro process for the e-migration will differ. In any case, MAPI Research Trust will be involved in the review of the original electronic screenshots. And if you are also developing a language version, MAPI Research Trust's linguistic validation partner, which is Icon Language Services, will assist with the migration of the translation and also the review of the electronic screenshots and certification. 
Well, excellent. Thank you for that, Katie. And again, thank you both uh, for the presentation. Uh, although at this point, we have reached the end of the Q&A session. Uh, to our audience members, please note that if we couldn't attend to your questions or if you have any further questions, uh, you can get in touch uh, with our speakers using the contact info that I've currently put up on the screen, uh, and they will have a chance to follow up with you uh, after the webinar. Hope you all found this uh, webinar informative, and we wish you all a great rest of your day.